We're told that somewhere between 4,000 and 3,000 B.C., the Sumerians in the region of Mesopotamia developed a form of communication called uh, cuneiform. And this was a system of writing where wedged-shaped marks were pressed into a soft clay tablet, and those variety of, of figures composed what is known as the first written system of language in the history of man. And much has changed since that time. Today we live in a world of information technology where that word tablet has taken on an entirely different new meaning. We live in a time where where data and facts and opinions can be transmitted across the Internet and seen by millions of people in a matter of a few seconds. And while the method of communication has dramatically changed over the years, the goal of communication has not changed. The goal remains the same. The goal is to connect with people, to help them to, to understand what we are trying to say to them, to express our, our thoughts and our, our ideas, things that are important to us. And amazingly, the creator of the universe, the God of heaven, has chosen to communicate with us. He has chosen to reach out to his creation through his word, through the Bible. And he has revealed to us certain things concerning himself. So we might, to a certain degree, understand him. So we might see the way that things are in his universe. So that we might respond to him and believe his word. And as we have been listening to the Apostle Paul teach us in the book of Romans, he has expressed to us the the heart of God, the mind of God. And we have observed that he has continually made reference to the Old Testament scriptures. He has used those scriptures as proof that what he has been saying to us in Romans is true. That what he has been saying is nothing new. It is what God has said all along. So the Old Testament scriptures help us to understand what God is communicating to us in the New Testament. And in Romans chapter 9, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has made extensive use of the Old Testament. He has used it to validate his words. That though God chose the nation of Israel, he chose them as his people, as his vineyard. He planted them. He nurtured them. He he revealed his glory to them. He dwelt among them. He gave them his law. He gave them his commandments. And though his word says that through that nation, the Messiah would come. All of this is true. But though all of this is true, yet we are told that not all from the nation of Israel are, in fact, the true Israel. They're not the spiritual Israel, the Israel that God has chosen. And we found that in Genesis chapter 21, that though Isaac and Ishmael were both children of Abraham, it was through Isaac that the blessing would come. Further, we read how in Genesis chapter 25, that though Jacob and Esau were both children of Isaac, that it was through Jacob that the blessing would come. What conclusion can we draw from that? Well, the conclusion we can draw is that God makes choices. He chooses, even from among the descendants of Abraham, He chooses through whom the blessing will come. So not all the children of Israel are spiritual children of Abraham. 
Not all are the children of promise. Some are children of wrath. Some are those who are under the wrath of God who will be cut off from him forever. Just as we were reminded in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 18, where the Lord told that prophet that God is like a potter, that he makes some vessels for honor, he makes other vessels for dishonor. The Lord chooses whom he will deliver. He chooses whom he will save. As we were told in Exodus chapter 33, when all of the nation of Israel had sinned against the Lord in the wilderness, all of them deserved to die. But we're told God spared some of them. He spared some. He killed others. And the Lord said to Moses, That he is a merciful God, yet he chooses to show mercy. He chooses to show compassion on some and not on others. And we don't understand that. But we know that God has a right to do what he does. He's God. He has a right to do what is right in his eyes. To raise up, to cast down men and kingdoms. All To show his glory. We're not in a position to understand these things, are we? We don't have the capacity to fully understand why God does what he does. But as we look at the Old Testament, we find that he consistently does according to his word. And who are we to question him? Who are we to revile the creator of the universe and to contradict him? We do. We're out of line. We've overstepped our bounds when we doubt his goodness. When we doubt his wisdom. When we doubt his righteousness. God is not accountable to us. We are accountable to him. And he chooses to save whom he chooses to save without our permission and without our approval. The plan of God still stands. As he says also in the Old Testament, in Hosea, Paul tells us in verse 25 of Romans chapter 9, that through that prophet who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, he spoke of judgment. Judgment upon the the ten tribes of that kingdom. Judgment that did fall upon them, we know, in 722 B.C. And Hosea witnessed that judgment as the Lord allowed the Assyrians to come sweeping in and to invade his homeland, to carry off his people, and to illustrate why God had allowed that in that nation. The Lord told Hosea to do an incredible thing. He told him to marry a woman named Gomer. A woman, he said, uh, who would be unfaithful. A wife of harlotry, she's called in Hosea chapter 1. A picture of the unfaithfulness of Israel to God. And Hosea was told by God that they were to have children, children of harlotry. So Gomer gave birth to a son. And the Lord told Hosea to name him Jezreel, a name which means God sows seed. God had scattered Israel like seed. Why? Because of their sin. Because of their rebellion. Because of their unfaithfulness to him. And Gomer gave birth to a second child, a daughter. And the Lord told Hosea to name her La Ruhama. A name which means I have no compassion. I will have no compassion on Israel. Then Gomer gave birth to another child, another son. The Lord told Hosea to name him Loami, which means, you are not my people. Terrible judgment that God 
brought down on these people. Why? Because they had been spiritually adulterous. Because they had been unfaithful to God, so the Lord scattered them among the nations. He removed them from their land. They were under his discipline. They were under his judgment. And for a time, they were left on their own. But, we're told, in verse 25 of Romans chapter 9, where Paul quotes from Hosea chapter 2, and he says this, The Lord speaks and says, I will call, I will call them back. Those who were for a time not my people, they will once again be my people. And the one who was not my beloved, why? Because of her sin, says once again, she will be my beloved. What's Paul's point here? Why is he telling us these things? Well, his point is this. That the disobedience and the unfaithfulness and the unbelief of the nation of Israel in rejecting their Messiah, in rejecting the Christ, was no surprise to God. Their history has shown that they rejected him, that they rejected his word. This kind of behavior among the people was nothing new. He had seen it all before. But in rejecting Christ, they had done nothing short of committing spiritual adultery. They were unfaithful to what the Lord had promised them. And in their unbelief, they still live today. It's a condition in which they live. They have rejected The Christ. But the Lord promised them something in Hosea chapter 1. He said to them, and Paul quotes it here in verse 26, It shall be that in the place, what place? The place to which they were scattered. Scattered where? Well, they've been scattered across the whole earth, haven't they? But just as they were scattered... Peter says in 1 Peter 2.10, that was like us. He said, we were scattered. We who did not know God were not the people of God. We were just like the nation of Israel when they were in their unbelief, when they were in their sin. By God's grace, we have become the children of God. So when the Jews rejected God, when they rejected their Messiah, when they rejected his word, they had become just like the Gentiles in their unbelief. Where it was said to them, verse 26, said to the nation of Israel in Hosea, you are not my people. But there is hope because they will be gathered together again. There will come a day when the remnant of that nation will come together and be called adulteresses no more. It says in verse 26, then they shall be called sons. Quios in Greek. True children of God. True children of the living God. Paul invites us to search the scriptures and to see for ourselves. It's all there in the Old Testament. The Lord has already communicated this to us and to the nation of Israel. The scattering of the people from the nation because of their unbelief has brought consequences upon them. It has brought consequences, but those consequences are all according to the plan, according to the word of God. Just as their rejection of Christ has brought consequences upon them even today, they have alienated themselves from him. They're in rebellion against him. But this won't last forever, the Lord says. 
And so, Paul quotes from the prophet Isaiah in verse 27. And in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 10, it is the prophet who cries out, it says. Kradzo. He screams like a bird, like a raven. Screams in anguish. Screams in pain. Even with a sense of urgency. Concerning Huper on behalf of Israel. His heart aches for them. It's a cry of sorrow. Given this time not to the northern kingdom, but given this time to the southern kingdom, to Judah. A cry because of their unbelief. A cry because of their disobedience. And that disobedience will have consequences for them. So it was, we know, between 605 and 586 B.C. that the Babylonians carried them off into captivity and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. So Isaiah warns them in verse 27. And Paul reminds us of the warning. He says here, Though the number of the sons of Israel may be as the sand of the sea, even though they may be too many to count, know this, that it is the remnant, a small portion of the nation. Only a small portion who have been chosen by God and only they will be saved. Sozo, only they will be delivered by God. Only a few by comparison to the multitude of people. Only a few will return to the land. Only a few will return to the Lord. Just as it is pictured Through another prophet in Amos chapter 3 verse 12 where it says this. The shepherd snatches a remnant, a couple of legs, a piece of an ear. He snatches a remnant of a sheep that he rips from the mouth of a lion. That's a pretty graphic picture. So, in the same way. The Lord will snatch a piece of Israel. He will snatch a piece of that nation from the mouth of the lion. From the enemy. From their unbelief. From judgment. And we are reminded in verse 28 that the Lord will execute poieo. In Greek, he will carry out his plan. He will fulfill his word upon all the earth. Nothing can stop what the Lord is doing. And he will do it thoroughly, we are told. Sunteleo. It will come to pass. It will happen. Don't doubt. God will accomplish what he has set out to accomplish. And it will come quickly, we are told. Suntemo. Like lightning. Swiftly, without delay. And just so we're clear, clear on these things that the unbelief of Israel was revealed to the prophets in the Old Testament. Paul once again quotes from Isaiah in verse 29 here. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 1 and he says, As Isaiah foretold and prophesied in in times past, he said this, Except the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the master of all things, the sovereign over all the earth, over the universe, unless by his grace he had withheld judgment upon the nation, unless he had interceded for them in their rejection of him, of his son, Unless he had done that, unless he had left for us en catalapo, left behind survivors, survivors from the nation, survivors from among us, a posterity, sparrow, descendants, a remnant from among the Jews, and we would add a remnant from among us, wouldn't we? A remnant from among the Gentiles. Unless... The hand of the Lord 
had been upon us, we would all have become as Sodom, and we would all have resembled Gomorrah. We would all have been judged. We would have all been destroyed. So it is by the grace of God that any of us still lives. So there's hope. There's hope for us in him. So Paul says, what, what shall we say then? What conclusion should we draw from this thing? He asks us in verse 30. Our God is in the heavens. He is the sovereign over all things. He chooses to whom he shows mercy. But though this is true, do not think that his sovereignty is inconsistent with our responsibility to believe his word. Though this may seem like a contradiction to us, it is not a contradiction with God. Consider this, Paul tells us, verse 30. Consider the fact that Gentiles, ethnos in Greek, people, people of the nations, of the world, people who now belong to Christ, they did not pursue righteousness, dioko, they didn't run after God. They didn't run after him to try to have a relationship with him by trying to make themselves acceptable to him by what they did and by who they were so that they might be found innocent before him. Paul said they didn't do that. Instead of running after God, it was God who ran after them in his righteousness and it was only by faith in him that they attained righteousness. Catalambano in Greek. Now they have that righteousness. They have the righteousness of Christ, which is now their own, even the righteousness, the only righteousness, that comes how? Paul says in verse 30, by faith. By faith in Christ. Oh, but the nation of Israel, well, they failed to see this truth, Paul says. And so they kept pursuing, running after a law of righteousness. They kept trying to follow the rules. They kept trying to follow the regulations. They tried to live a lifestyle of righteousness that they could never attain. They kept relying on their birthright. They kept relying on their background to validate themselves before God. So Paul says in verse 31, they did not arrive at that law. Fathano. They didn't reach the goal. They never reached the goal of righteousness. So now they still stand guilty before God, as all do who attempt to work their way to heaven. Why? Paul says they didn't pursue it by faith but as though it were possible even to attain righteousness by works. That's what they did. Aragon. They tried to do it by their own abilities. They tried to do it by their own efforts. Like many today, they didn't see their need of a Savior. And so, Paul says, they stumbled. Proskopta. They tripped. And they cut themselves as they fell over the stumbling stone, the proskoma, over the rock that got in their way. And that rock is Christ. Christ got in their way. He always gets in the way of people who are trying to work their way to heaven. He becomes an obstacle. He becomes a source of contention. He becomes a source of anger. Not the means of salvation for them. Just as it is written in the scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 8. And in Isaiah chapter 28. Just as the Lord has said it would happen. Behold he says he do. Pay attention to this. Pay attention so you might understand these things. Christ is the chief cornerstone. We're told that in Psalm 118. He is the one upon whom we are to build our lives. But many reject him, don't they? 
they reject the Lord. So it was Isaiah who said, I lay in Zion, in Israel, in Jerusalem, what is to them a stone of stumbling. Their expectations of the Messiah, their expectations of salvation through him, are now an impediment to them. Their misunderstanding, their unbelief is getting in the way of the truth, like many people today who stumble. Stumble over their religion. They stumble over their intellect. They stumble over their pride. But these things are getting in the way. They're stopping them from seeing the truth. And they always find a reason to stumble over the person of Christ, don't they? And though Christ is, to those of us who believe, the rock of our salvation, to those who do not believe, Paul says in verse 33, he is a rock of offense. Scandalon, the one who is a hindrance, the one who is rejected, the one who is a source of confusion and of anger. But the one, it says in Daniel chapter 2, that will someday crush the nations into pieces because of their rejection of him. Ah, but Paul says, on the other hand, we who believe, the one who believes in him, pistuo, the one who puts their faith and their trust in Christ, that person will not be disappointed. Kataskuno, we won't be put to shame. We won't be deceived. We will, we won't be in fear. We, we won't be cut to pieces in judgment. We can count on Christ. As the scriptures have told us, and as Paul has reminded us, by faith we believe that a remnant will be saved, all according to the plan of God, a plan that he has communicated to us in his word. And he has fulfilled his word To us in Christ. So we who are the ones who believe, we are that remnant. We are those survivors. We have been snatched. We have been rescued out of the mouth of the lion forever. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.